next unit that we will be covering is entitled HIPAA and Health Data Security and Privacy Requirements. The unit objectives for this particular unit are to describe how HIPAA relates to the health information exchange, both electronic and non-electronic, to identify the steps for compliance with the HIPAA privacy rule, identify the steps for compliance with the HIPAA security rule, and to review a compliance framework, or what do I need to build in order to comply with the HIPAA security rule and the privacy rule. Next slide. Other requirements include securing hardware, software, portable devices, and portable media. It means that your hardware needs to be secure. This is not just the workstation. This is a laptop, maybe a PDA, it may be a smartphone. Your software, it could be such things as a flash drive. It could be a flash card. It could be a CD-ROM or a DVD-ROM. Your portable devices and portable media. These days, you can, on a micro flash card that fits into a smartphone you can store 8 to 16 gigabytes of information that's a whole heck of a lot of information that can be stored on a small space it's making sure that those devices are not only secure it could also be mean going the extra step to make sure that as an example a laptop that is taken off site the hard drive is encrypted and this is something that is reasonable given the cost of encrypting hard drives um, it's well within reach of even the smaller providers. It's making sure that the storage of that protected health information is secure so that if you're storing information on tapes, paper, what have you, that it's secure. And that when it's time to destroy that information because it, it will no longer be used or say it's a hard drive on a computer that is being surplused out, that you destroy that media it could be taking a, an old DVD or a CD-ROM and sticking it in the shredder. It could be degaussing a hard drive, which is using a specially made magnet that's used to go across a hard drive and wipe out the data that's on that hard drive. It's good to remember that just by clicking delete does not mean that the data is gone. All that does is removes an electronic marker that indicates the data was there. The data is only erased in that particular case when something is written over the top of it, and that is generally done on a random basis. It's not like there are the, there's a logical sequence where if you delete something, that then something is immediately written over that. There are software packages that can be purchased at your local um, Best Buy or Office Max and so forth where you can install it and recover data which has just been deleted rather than, say, the hard drive being formatted two times. It's making sure that your data is backed up on a regular basis, and it's making sure that you test your recovery. Just because the, the information is backed up does not necessarily mean that the data can be recovered. There are many organizations have found that out to their chagrin, where they have dutifully backed up the data, and then when they found out that the data that they had was corrupted, they were unable to recover the data from the disks or tapes or the optical disks that they had saved that information to. So it's important to test both the backup and the recovery on a regular basis, and it's to make sure that the data that is backed up is maintained securely. Is deploying an enterprise encryption solution for data in transit and more and more also data at rest. These days, the healthcare industry, if the information is considered especially sensitive, more and more within an organization, that data is being encrypted so that only appropriate staff within the organization have access to that data. It is critical that if information is being sent over the Internet via either, say, a secure FTP site, a VPN, email, and so forth, that that information is encrypted and it's encrypted at an appropriate level, which at this point in time is at a minimum of 256-bit encryption. When the security rule was final, and in effect in 2005, it listed encryption as an addressable item. Well, it's no longer addressable in the sense that any organization would be hard-pressed to indicate that they are not going to use encryption. The three choices you have when something is addressable is either you do it, you do something similar to it that's equivalent in protection, or you better have darn good documentation as to why you're not doing it. 
These days a small organization for as little as $100 per person that needs to send information securely can have access to a very good, sound, secure messaging product. The reason that it was considered addressable at the time was the rule was actually published initially in April of 2003 and it gave two years for the industry to comply with the rule. At that point in time encryption was considered expensive and it was considered not mature so it was listed as addressable at that point. But times have changed. So it's making sure that you are deploying an enterprise encryption solution. It's also integrating and aligning your business processes with enterprise security. It's that balancing act again. You want to make sure that you're able to conduct business, that you're able to take care of payments, patients, pay claims, and so forth, but you also have appropriate security controls in place to make sure that somebody who should not have access can't get access to the patient's information or the health plan member's information or they can't hack into your system and so forth. Next slide.